Test 4. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between Peter and Jim talking about some details for their shared accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hey Jim, it's Peter. Oh hey Peter, what's up? I thought I'd call so we could hammer out the details for next year's lease. Peter says that he wants to hammer out the details for next year's lease with Jim. So. Lease has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hey Jim, it's Peter. Oh hey Peter, what's up? I thought I'd call so we could hammer out the details for next year's lease. That's a good idea. Did we ever decide on how to split the total rent? Well, I was thinking, since my room is bigger, I probably should pay a little more. So I could pay £110 and you could pay £80. Does that sound OK? Considering that my old apartment cost me £100 for a smaller room, I'm definitely all right with that. Hey, I was looking at a map of the area and can't seem to find a bus stop near it. Do you know where we would catch the bus? Well, the bus is actually pretty far from us. But we have that garage that we can park our cars in. Wow, that's great. Convenient parking is hard to find, so we're lucky we have that. OK, so we have a whole lot of things we'll need to buy when we move in. How do you want to split that up? I was wondering, do you still work at the supermarket? Yep, every Tuesday and Saturday. Would you be able to buy things from there if I sent you a shopping list? Sure, I can do that. Great. Then I can take care of whatever else we need that you wouldn't get at a supermarket. If you want, I'll pick you up from work that day and we can go to the apartment together. Oh, that would be great. Thanks. No problem. That way we can split the cost of petrol. Works for me. It's so expensive these days, isn't it? It's downright obscene. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. So let's figure out what appliances we need. Do we have a microwave? Yes, the landlord's providing that for us. Hey, do you still have that space heater, though? We need one for the kitchen since it's not connected to the central heating. All right, I'll bring that. Anything else? Well, I have some dining room and living room furniture I can bring, so that should take care of most of the big stuff. You know what we do need, though? Could you bring a toaster? I actually don't have one. It doesn't come with the microwave. No, the landlord is only supplying the microwave. It would really help if you could bring one. OK, I'll pick one up at the store. You know, I also have this cool antique rotary phone that would be a cool addition to the apartment, sort of as decoration and utility. Oh, cool. The only thing is, 
We'd have to put it in the kitchen unless you want it in your room. Why not put it in the living room? The living room's too loud to have a phone conversation. The noise sort of carries. So if one person is trying to watch TV or have friends over, the person on the phone won't be able to hear. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess kitchen it is then. Any other big things we need? That seems like everything. That's all I can think of. And of course, move-in is June the first. I can't wait. We'll be able to watch the big game in our new apartment. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, we can move in in the morning, and then Friday night we can sit back and cheer on Liverpool. I have an exam in the morning, but we'll be done around eleven a.m. and can move in after. Wait, Liverpool? You're joking, right? I thought you were a Manchester United fan. Man, you? No way. Liverpool all the way. Oh no, I, I don't know if I can live with a Liverpool fan. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Hello, Clark Cycle Hire. My name's Keith. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I saw your ad in the local paper, and as I'm thinking of doing some cycling, I'm wondering what kinds of bike you have and what your prices are like. Well, we hire out two main types of machine: touring and mountain bikes. Are you likely to be riding off road? Do you think? No, I'll probably be sticking to roads and country lanes, so a touring bike would be best, I think. Right. Well, the rate will be fifty pounds for a week or fourteen pounds per day. So it's a lot cheaper to rent by the week. Yes, definitely. Though it's important to bring the bike back on time, otherwise I'm afraid we have to charge a late return fee. And how much is that? For each additional hour, it's one pound twenty-five. So if you were a day late, it would cost another thirty pounds. Yes, that's right. I'd make sure I didn't do that then. I should also point out there's a deposit which you get back when you return the bicycle, in good condition, of course. On touring models, it's sixty pounds. Is there anything else I'd have to pay? No, that's it. Though, if you're planning to ride fairly long distances, you might like to have one or two accessories. Such as? Well, for another five pounds, we can supply lightweight bags, either panniers or the handlebar sort. It's amazing how much they can carry, and the way they're designed means they don't get in the way when you're riding. Well, I'll see. But what about essential things like a pump and a repair kit? I wouldn't have to pay extra for those, would I? No, no, no. There's no charge for things like that, or for a lock. It's a good strong one too. Just make sure you don't lose the key. That reminds me. What about insurance? What happens if someone steals the bike, in spite of the wonderful lock? Didn't I mention that? Oh, I, I should have told you that's included in the rental too. And it covers everything, does it?、Uh, it covers you against theft of the bike, yes, as long as it's securely locked at the time. You'd have to pay part of any individual claim, though. How much? If the bike was stolen and not recovered, you'd be liable for the first hundred pounds. Hmm. So, if I do go ahead and rent one, how do I pay? By cheque, or would it have to be cash? Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We can only accept credit card bookings. Otherwise, we'd have to ask our customers for the full value of the machine as a deposit. I've got a visa in my name. Would that be okay? Sure. 
before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So if I want to have a look at the bikes, how do I find you? I live near the university, by the way. Right. First you take Woods Road as far as the main police station. I know it. It's right next to the park. Yes, that's it. And after the police station, there's a turning to the right called Oak Street. At the big supermarket? Uh, no, it's before then. It's actually between the police station and a garage on the other side. OK. So, you go down Oak Street until you reach the health centre on the right. If you get to a pub called the Maple Leaf, you've gone too far. All right? Yes, I've got that. Now, opposite the health centre, there's a pharmacy, and we're just behind that. OK, fine. I'll try to call over sometime tomorrow. Great. See you then. Bye. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You'll hear two friends planning an event. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Joan. I'm glad you could come. Hello, Peter. What's up? Is something the matter? No, no. Everything's fine. It sounded urgent on the phone. Did it? It's just that I've had this idea and I wanted to see how soon we could get it off the ground. Well, don't keep me in suspense. You know they're planning to close down the local clinic. It was in the newspaper yesterday, but most people have actually known for some time. Well, I thought we should do something about it. What did you have in mind? I thought we could organise a charity event and donate the money to the clinic. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it will show the local council how we feel and that we mean business. That'll take quite a lot of organising. Why don't we just hold a protest outside the town hall? A protest would take just as much organisation as an event like this. Besides, I think fewer people would turn up. A village fair, or something like that, would attract more people and get money for the clinic. People are more generous when they're enjoying themselves. OK, then. It sounds good to me. How do we start? First, we put our heads together and come up with a list of people who'll be willing to help and people who can provide us with some of the things we need. For example, we might need a caterer to provide refreshments, a rock band for entertainment, tents and so on. Then, we do a lot of telephoning around and try to get everybody together at the same time in the same place. Sounds like a lot of work to me. Well, that's only the beginning. First things first, though. Let's decide now on who to get to the initial meeting and where and when to hold it. Fine. Well, the village hall would be the best place to have the meeting. It's not as big as the youth club, but it's warmer. There'll be no problem getting permission to use it. But I suppose it depends on how many people we invite. We don't want too many, 
otherwise the meeting will go on too long and nothing will get decided. But the village hall is a good idea. It's more official than having it in someone's living room. How many? Six or eight people to start with? Ten at the most? OK, now we have to decide on a suitable day and time. Suitable to everybody, I mean. A Saturday or Sunday would seem to be the best choice because people aren't at work on those days. But they may not like the idea of giving up a part of their weekend for a meeting. Unless we persuade them it's for a good cause, or that it's to their advantage, and that it'll all be a lot of fun. We'll provide refreshments, of course. What if some don't want to give up their weekend? Then we'll give them an alternative. Say, one evening in the week after everybody's finished work. We'll see which is the most acceptable to them. Then book the hall. I can do the refreshments for the meeting. I'll get Darren and Maggie to help me. I'm sure they'll be more than willing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, what's next on the agenda? A list of who we want at the meeting. Yes, of course. Obviously, we want someone from the clinic. I think Dr Perkins would be best. He can tell us exactly what the financial situation is there. You know, how much money it takes to keep the place running and how important it is for the community to have the clinic. The vicar, too. He can rally lots of support. And Mr Sims, our Member of Parliament. He is very busy, but I think I can persuade him to come, or get his wife to persuade him to come. I see her quite a lot socially. That's great. Two other people I have in mind are Freddie Smith... The journalist? Yes. Well, he's the editor of the local paper now and might be useful. He might let us advertise for free, and he'll know how to go about getting leaflets and posters printed. That's another thing. We'll need volunteers to put leaflets through people's doors and stick up posters all over the place. We can decide that at the meeting. What about the other person? What other person? You said you had two people in mind, Freddie Smith and... Oh, yes, Mr Gates. Mr Gates, do I know him? You must do. He owns Greatfields Farm. We need a large area to hold the fate. Right. So how many have we got then? Seven or eight? There's Dr Perkins, Mr Sims, that journalist... Freddie Smith, you mean? Yes, him. And the vicar and Mr Gates, the farmer. That's only five. There's you and me, that's seven... That will do for now. Let's start making phone calls. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You're going to hear part of a lecture about the introduction of cane toads into Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, I want to look at one of Australia's least loved animals, but one that has an interesting history from which I think we can learn a fundamental lesson about problem solving. While Australia is famous for its many wonderful native animals, in particular the kangaroo and the koala, it also has some less attractive animals, many of which were actually brought to Australia in the 19th and 20th centuries. Perhaps the most well-known introduced animal is the rabbit, brought originally by the early settlers as a source of food. Another animal to be introduced by the settlers was the fox, for the purpose of sport in the form of fox hunting. But perhaps the most unusual animal ever brought here was the cane toad. Here's a picture of one. It's a large and, some people would say, very ugly species of toad and was deliberately imported to this country by the sugarcane farmers in 1935 to eradicate the beetle which kills the sugarcane plant. The cane beetle is the natural enemy of the sugarcane plant. It lives in the cane and drops its eggs onto the ground around the base of the plant. The eggs develop into grubs, and then the grub eats the roots of the cane, resulting in the death of the plant. In the mid-thirties, there was a serious outbreak of cane beetle, and the farmers became desperate to get rid of the pest which was ruining their livelihood. Meanwhile, news was trickling in from overseas about a toad, native to Central America, which supposedly ate the beetles which killed the cane. It was reported that the toad had been taken to Hawaii, where cane is also grown, and introduced with apparent success. So, with the backing of the Queensland authorities, the farmers arranged to import 100 toads from Hawaii. The toads were then released into the cane fields to undertake the eradication of the cane beetle. As predicted, the toads started to breed successfully, and within a very short time their numbers had swollen. But there was one serious problem. It turned out that cane toads do not eat cane beetles. And the reason for this is that toads live on insects that are found on the ground, and the cane beetle lives at the top of the cane plant, well out of reach of the toads. In fact, they never come into contact with each other. Now, you may well ask, how did this terrible mistake ever happen? And the reason is quite simply that the farmers were desperate to find a way of ridding their fields of the cane beetle, and so they accepted the reports that had been written without ever doing their own research. And the added irony is that in 1947, just 12 years later, an effective pesticide was developed which kills the beetle, thereby ensuring the survival of the sugarcane industry to this day. Meanwhile, much of tropical northeast Australia is infested with the cane toad, which serves no purpose whatsoever, and experts claim that the toad is spreading south in plague proportions. Now, as agricultural scientists, we have to ask ourselves, what lessons are to be learned from this tale? And I can think of three main points. Firstly, one should never rely on claims which are not backed up by evidence i.e., in this case, evidence that the cane toad actually eats the grub of the cane beetle and thereby kills the pest. Secondly, we should look very carefully at possible effects of introducing any living species into a new environment. And lastly, one should not allow one's decision-making to be influenced by a sense of desperation which may cloud the issue. In other words, one should always seek objective advice.